We have the story where the Herodians and the Pharisees join forces and go to Jesus with a question. And the question is, you know, we, we, we know that you're honest. We know that you talk about God's ways. So tell us, does our law allow us to pay taxes to Romans or not? Now, there's a whole raft of problems with that. And it really comes down to a question of priorities. Do I follow God or do I tend to my daily struggles, my daily problems? And we all fight that issue. I mean, it's something we all face. You know, how do I put God first in, in, in my daily um, routine? The, the problems I face, the, the things that I do, the things that I feel I need to do. Now, the Pharisees and the Herodians were strange bedfellows in the following way. The Pharisees was a religious, to call them a religious party, it really doesn't do them justice. It's more of a religious philosophy. And this religious philosophy tried to answer the question, why do bad things happen to us good people? We are the chosen people. Why did the Babylonian exile happen? Why are we, why are we ruled by all these foreigners for the last 500 years of our existence. And their answer was that we didn't follow the law clearly enough. We didn't follow it closely enough. And so they began, they, they began to develop this um, set of rules and regulations and they became extreme experts on the law and they developed these rules and regulations from that point that allowed them to, as, as one rabbi described it, build a fence around the Torah. So if you, even if you broke some of these rules and regulations that they had set up for a very highly regimented lifestyle, you still wouldn't break the Torah. They lived this life of ritual purity, and it was a ritual purity that was away from uh, the foreigners, the Gentiles. And, and they had this, these a very elaborate, elaborate ways of maintaining their place in the world while at the same time keeping kosher. So they wanted two things. They wanted ritual purity to, to follow the, the Torah as closely as they could so that they could please God. And they wanted to keep away from the, 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 the Gentiles or what they called the Goyim because God had proclaimed that I am holy and you should be holy in this, in this, in this sense of holiness is separateness being one of a kind, being special. So that's how they lived their lives. Now, the Herodians, on the other hand, were 180 degrees away from the Pharisees. The Herodians were the people that were established. It was basically the royal court of King Herod the Great. Now, the Herodians are his royal court. They're pro-Roman. And, oh, by the way, they were probably Jewish only in name only. And they were basically, went full in, it's the uh, part of the uh, Greek culture, even to the point of building pagan temples within their kingdom just to keep the Romans happy. So, so you have these two groups, ritually pure, Jewish in name only, but besides that, were part of the general culture. So these two get together, and they're asking the question, is it okay to pay taxes to Rome or not? Now, if you didn't pay taxes to Rome, you would be kind of like the, 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 uh, Fa the Pharisees. I know they had workarounds. They were separatists, by the way, not, not 
nationalists. You know, they wanted to live their life separately, but they, they accepted the fact that the Romans were ruling. But if you, if you said, if Jesus said, no, don't pay taxes, the people who followed the Pharisees would have said, yay, he's one of us. But the Romans would be upset, and they would charge him with treason. Now, on the other hand, if he would have said, oh, sure, pay taxes to the Romans, the Herodians would be going, yay, but the general populace would see him as a traitor. So they're trying to stick him in the box. You know, either one way or the other, you know, make up your mind. So would he reject paying taxes to Rome to keep himself undefiled, or would he break kosher in the question of paying tribute? Well, by the way, you know whose image was on the coin was the emperor's. So if you pay tribute, not only are you paying tax to Rome, you're also, in a way, committing an act of idolatry to the emperor because the emperor was seen as ruling, if not a god, he was ruling according to the gods of Rome their divine will. So Jesus gives an enigmatic answer. Give to you know, Caesar, what is Caesar's, what is God, what is God. But what is he doing? He's holding up the corn, so he's already made himself unkosher by handling this, this, this Roman coinage. And what he does is he flips back the question to, his, to the questioners. It's like, you guys have got to clarify your position. Why are you throwing this on us? But on a deeper level, I think, God, I think Jesus is being extremely practical. We all face that problem in our lives. How do we give to God first and live our daily lives? You know, it, it, yeah, I know it's a question of taxes, but I think, the, I think the issue is much bigger. And the way we answer that and the way we discover how do we make those choices is by discerning it in prayer. God always has the initiative in his relationship with us. He created us, but that's on a natural level, but on a supernatural level, he offers us grace. And that is also part of his prerogative and in his initiative. And the first and the beginning gift of grace that he offers us is faith. So even our call to prayer is God's gift to us. What does Paul say about prayer? It's only in the spirit that we can call God, Abba, Father. So it's the spirit that's moving us to prayer. So even that is God's initiative in our lives. Now, Okay. Blessing is a verbal prayer. The question is, who are we blessing? Now, on the one level, we bless God. Have you ever heard the, the, the prayer over the gifts on the procession? Blessed are you, Lord God, King of the universe, for the, the fruit of the vine. Okay, That is a typical, classic Jewish prayer. And what they're doing is... They're saying, God has already given us this stuff, the, these, this, these materials, these products. By the way, he's given us our relationships. And so we're blessing him. So in a sense, that sort of Jewish blessing is a thanksgiving prayer. It's the equivalent of saying, thanks, God. Now, we as Catholics and as Christians sort of look at prayer different, or look at blessing differently um, what we're asking for is the God to bless the stuff that we already have. You know, what, what's the 
what's the grace before meals? Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we're about to receive from thy bounty. You can go on with that. Um, so in a sense, that Christian, especially Catholic sense of blessing, is petition. God, take the stuff we already have and bless it. Make it special. So you have the Jewish on the one hand, which is thanking God for the gifts he's already giving us. What we're asking as Catholics and as Christians is to make those things special for us. You know, sort of give them your, sort of put yourself into them. Let's talk about Thanksgiving first. Um, Thanksgiving, if we were to talk about a proper attitude in worship, for Catholics especially, it's Thanksgiving. We all know what the word Eucharist means. It means Thanksgiving or gratitude. That is what we should be going into our, uh, going into the Mass especially, or any form of prayer is a sense of gratitude. Thank you, God, for this gift that you've given us. And we're thanking God, especially at Mass, not only for the gifts he's given us, but for his presence with us. Thank you, God, for being one with us. And that is at the heart of the Eucharist, is that he is present with us. He has come down to be with us to be with his people, to be with me and you. The petition pretty much chews up, I would say, the majority of our verbal prayer time. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a prayer to God asking for him to fulfill our wants and our needs. Um, and, but you know what's funny, in, especially in the catechism, is we think about those in terms of being sort of our selfish side. This is, oh God, give me the stuff I want. And I always, I always joke about the ATM God. You know, you stick your, you, you know, you, you, you stick your card and you pull it on out. And God, give me the goodies. But when we pray to God, when we petition God, we implicitly reveal our dependence upon him. We're not in charge. He is. So if you have those times where you're kind of panicking, even in those times of panic prayer, oh God, please, you know, reminds me when I was a little kid and I knew I was going to get in trouble. Oh God, get me out of this, please. I promise I'll never do this again. You know, um, even that shows that we, that we are returning to him and he is the source of all. So, even in those times of panic, panicked prayer, we are recognizing who we are and who he is, that he is the source of all, and we depend upon him. Intercession is a is is a, a spin-off, if you will, from petition, but intercession is not focused on us, it's focused upon the needs of others. And why did Jesus come to this earth? To be not only our mediator, but to be our intercessor. So he is he as the high priest as uh, modeled and revealed in the book of Hebrews, he is the high priest who is interceding for us before the Father. And so when we are praying for the good of others, we are imitating Christ. We are being, you know, we're being the hands and feet and the eyes and ears of Christ just in our prayer for the good of others. And it turns us away from our own selfishness. It turns us towards the good of others. And in that sense, intercessory prayer builds up character. Because not about me. It's about the good of somebody else.
Adoration and praise are closely linked. But the difference mm -hmm. is that adoration is the emotion. It's the awe that we feel before God. That, that you know, this overwhelming sense that his presence um, is just so great that it can't be fathomed. And we may, you know, we don't get those, obviously we don't get that 24-7. We may get just glimpses of it, but that, those glimpses are good enough. It is, and the catechism defines it as respectful silence in his presence. And I really think that that sort of sums up what adoration is. Now, praise gives verbal substance to adoration. It praises God with our hands and our lips, in body language and in words. You know, we raise our hands to God, especially in the Our Father, and we pray, or we, we join hands. But it's a sense of, of togetherness. We praise God with our lips. And it's, in a way, it sums up all the other forms of prayer simply by giving God his due. Adoration is the cause praises the result. So let's just return back to the question of the denarius. Jesus sort of not only points it back to the Herodians and the Pharisees, but he also points it to us. He says, give to God, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. And what do we do? What do we owe God? We owe God obviously everything. The first step in giving God his due is in prayer. 